to start off, I know there's been a little bit of mirth around the traps about the photo that got sent around with the meeting invitation. Uh, years, years ago, Mike Grundy came up with a really interesting paradigm about the stages of your career. And when you were a young whippersnapper, as I was when that photo was taken, you were very inexperienced and terrified by everything going on. And you got a bit older and you were a bit full of yourself. You started to know a bit and become useful. And then you get to the era where I am now, where I find myself saying things like, 20 years ago, we did that. Uh, I said to someone the other day, I've turned into uh, George Smith. So this is a, uh, a quick tour around the countryside. Uh, it might take a bit more than half an hour. Feel free to leave whenever you want. Um, and it's going to be looking at some esoteric, slightly different and unusual things, uh, both on the soil surface and deep down, and a few of the, the different landscapes that lead to these strange and wonderful mysterious features we have in the countryside. So we'll start quickly in Toowoomba with some red stuff, and then we'll shoot out to Condamine to look at some old stuff. And then uh, you probably can't see it at the top of the screen, but it's going up there to Injun to look at some wet stuff. And then we're going to stop just north of Surat to look at some more red stuff, but a little bit different maybe to what we have in Toowoomba. Down to north of St George to look at some sandy stuff. Uh, whiz down past uh, something in Thallon, across the border rivers to look at some salty countryside. And we'll last stop will be Ilaban near Gundawindi to look at some white stuff. Then we'll be back home. So starting in Toowoomba, uh, those of you who know Toowoomba, it's a plateau on top of the Great Dividing Range. We have tertiary basalts about 20 million years old. And the old theory was that there was lots of lava that came out as flood basalt flows. If you've driven north of Toowoomba, you know that the red plateau actually rises up to the north multiple times. We have the Highfields Plateau and then we have the Peachy Plateau. There's some stuff even further north of Crow's Nest. Uh, there wasn't just lava, there was lots of pyroclastics and this mysterious stuff called red material, which Stewie McNish and Tony Coppy studied in intricate detail about 20 years ago and discovered that it wasn't actually laterite. The old theory was that Toowoomba and the other surfaces were lateritic surfaces, weathered during the tertiary. In fact, that's not quite the case. Uh, and here's a photo I took just the other day up the hill from my house, uh, cutting at the school. The, uh, you can see two different levels of fill on top. Uh, don't worry about those. It's that red material underneath that's the, the actual original parent material. You can see why people thought it was laterite, uh, but uh, if ever you're driving around Toowoomba, you can find the odd cutting of it. And if you go to the edge of the range, you can actually find fresh columnar basalt directly underneath it, which is why we know it's not actually laterite. And it is um, very, very heavily weathered volcanic ash uh, and if you're lucky enough in the right sort of cuttings you'll see fining up sequences in the deposition of the ash. It's been the source of much debate uh, over the years as to whether or not the red stuff up here is laterite or not and a lot of people still think it is uh, but in fact it, it isn't. So that, that gets us going in terms of, of age um, and we're going to go a little bit west uh, to Condamine to look at this in a little bit more detail. One of the things that we often find ourselves asking when we're standing in the middle of a paddock is how old is this stuff? How long ago did it get here? How long has it been sitting here in this, this landscape? It's probably the thing we know the least about of our landscapes is how old they are. All we have to go by is the geology maps that if they say something's T, it's tertiary. And if they say it's Q, it's quaternary, and that's about the sum total of, of our age knowledge. We've been lucky enough in the last couple of years through various projects to um, pick up some samples for age dating by OSL. So we are starting to get a tiny, tiny bit of knowledge about uh, how old some of our landscapes are. So the spot we're looking at 
is uh, between Miles and Condamine. You've got the Warrego Highway at the top of the picture there. The Condamine River uh, comes through from the east. Running north-south is the Cumbrilla Ridge and that's both a topographic feature but it's also a geological feature as it separates the Cretaceous uh, sediments of the surface of the Surratt Basin to the west and the Jurassic sediments of the surface of the Clarence Morton Basin to the east. And uh, as I said, the Condamine is coming through from the east. Over the years, it's cut uh, a nick through that uh, Cumbrilla Ridge and um, heads off down to the southwest. Coming in from the north is an old flow path, an old floodplain, very much relic above the current river. The current river is about seven, eight, ten metres down from that surface. Uh, and we were doing some work there looking at, at irrigation uh, salinity risk. So we were digging a few deep holes and we sampled one of those and you should be able to see there um, the ages at six and a half meters down, it was 144,000 years old. And by the time you get to eight, nearly eight and a half meters, it was 212,000 years old. So it gives you a bit of an idea of how long that's been sitting around in relative terms. If you do the sums, it means the soil's building up at about 1 20th or something of a millimetre per year. Obviously, the clay uh, units were probably deposited in back playing environments and the sand units were deposited in much higher velocity fluvial environments. So that they were probably deposited at very different rates. So there you go. For the first time, we actually have some idea of how old uh, some of our materials are. So then we're going to, while we're there, uh, and we've got the opportunity to look deep, uh, consider the difference in our knowledge. So when we look just at the top little bit, and when we look deeper, and this is a theme that will appear a few times through this talk. Normal old hole digging, one and a half meters, two meters max. And we have our quintessential pH inversion vertisols, Briglow vertisols, alkaline on the surface, rapidly becoming very acid. They seem to invariably stabilize at a pH of somewhere between four and four and a half. And the chemists out there can work out why that is one day. What happens when you go down the profile? Well, we have a pH inversion, reversion or reinversion, depending on your English. And some of it goes back to quite alkaline pHs, some of it stayed acid. Uh, as best we can tell, those alkaline zones are actually a feature related to old groundwater tables. Uh, but you can see even in, uh, in the profiles that stayed acid to eight, nine meters, they did eventually creep up to alkaline pH uh, towards the bottom. So yeah, when you look deep, Sometimes you, you see some quite interesting things. So let's go a little bit further north and west. We've, we're heading up to some artesian basin springs that are northeast of Injun. So we've gone to Roma and then north 100k up to Injun and then about another 30k northeast of there. Uh, and working in springs is a very, very different scale to what we've just been looking at. We've been looking at big old landscapes, big depths of materials, uh, and uh, big broad geomorphic processes. Springs, we're looking at the opposite end of the scale. So this is where we are, um, to the northeast of Injun, along Injun Creek. And uh, you can see quite easily on the image, up on the northeastern side, we have quartzo sandstones, lots of resistant plateaus. And the left-hand side, southwestern side of the image, is all very heavily cleared because it's less resistant mudstones that are producing more fertile soils, vertisols and dermosols. And we're right on the boundary between those two units and there's a fault line that runs along there. And that's why these springs are where they are because of that fault line. <laughs> So if we zoom in a little bit, we're on uh, Injun Creek there. You can see some quartzo sandstone to the north, some softer country to the west. And uh, that red dot is where we're headed. We zoom in a bit more, you can still see that red dot at the top of the image. 
and there's three or two main spring, spring clusters here on the north side and one spring on the southern side of the creek. See a lot of bare surfaces there. Um, landscape is fairly heavily affected by sheet erosion uh, and of course part of the reason for that is because of the springs. Um, we're going to be looking at the spring cluster on the northern side and where I've put the dash red line is essentially where the main expression of the fault line is. Remembering this is a fault complex so there's multiple components to the fault it's not just a singular fault line. Uh, we zoom in a little bit more there's the spring cluster we're looking at and those of you uh, who are observant enough will see that's where the fault is lying uh, and there's we're fairly sure another expression of the fault line over on that side uh, because where the springs are lying is a depression in the landscape in between those two points. Now we have there an isolated uh, outcrop of very very ferruginized sandstone that we're not entirely sure the reason for it but there are similar outcrops on the other side of the valley and we think they might actually be uh, old groundwater related features they, they were ferruginized as a result of a groundwater table way back when we've got various evidence that sort of underpins that like on the other side of the valley there's a 15 meter thick unconsolidated deposit two-thirds of the way up the hill slope so even though we're looking at a big east-west valley at this point in time we're fairly sure it was was much thicker uh, deposit of unconsolidated material. All the little yellow dots are springs some of them are so small you can't even see them and the main spring we're going to be looking at is the one with the orange uh, star in the middle. Over on the right hand side those stripes are in fact linear gilgai uh, and as you'd expect there's a grey vertisol there it's because on the right hand side of the fault we have uh, Jurassic mudstones exposed to the left of the fault we have sandstones exposed hill slope comes down to the middle there sodasols and dermosols scattered around the joint uh, on the majority of the area where the springs are and of course as you'd expect organosols and, and hydrosols the whole lot's draining from north to south down towards Injun Creek. If we look at a cross section through there, uh, which we did both uh, with topography as well as geophysics, uh, we did resistivity and you can see the spring there in the middle, the green bump, uh, and very obviously the quartzo sandstones giving very, very low conductivity uh, underneath the springs and then the expression of the fault line very abruptly on the right hand side and you get into the mudstones which are a lot more conductive. Springs themselves are very non-conductive uh, so as well as doing uh, resistivity transects through the springs we were doing various types of EM surveys and um, it's no surprise that springs are non-conductive when you think about the fact that they're just peat floating on water. There's no clay in them, there's no salt in them, there's no nothing in them to actually conduct uh, an EM signal. But EM was very very good at picking out even the smallest of the springs uh, and it helped us discern drainage tails running down the hill slope from one spring to the next spring to the next spring. That's what the springs look like on the ground. That's looking straight down the hill slope. There's the ferruginized sandstone outcrop on the right hand side of the picture. The fault line uh, and the vertisols are off to the left hand side. Uh, and Indian Creek is down in the distance there. There's a, a east west look across one of the springs, the, the main spring in that cluster. Uh, you can see they're not terribly big, only about a meter elevation, meter and a half elevation covered in sedges of various sorts. Um, the botanical side of these springs is very, very important. These ones are not super brilliant because they get flogged by cattle walking across them and pigs digging in them. Some of the springs look just like that. Uh, they're not very big, only a metre, half a metre across, and they're often just signified by a green patch. But if you look very, very carefully in the middle of them, you'll find 
various aquatic species and depending on the time of the year they'll be seeping a little bit of water. Other side of the valley, some of them are more akin to something that you'd see in New Zealand. They're more like a mud volcano, as one of my colleagues found out when he fell in one of them. Um, so, and on that side of the valley, some of them are not mud volcanoes, they're actually flowing sands. Uh, and they're essentially just a mound of sand. I've mentioned before the veg species are very important. That's one of the key species, a thing called area colon. It's a little tiny succulent. Uh, the botanists get terribly excited about it. And it's the, there are multiple definitions of these springs and one of the definitions uh, relates to the presence of certain indicator species in them. Springs are of course protected under the EPBC Act and the reason we were there was to look at the impact of CSG on the extent of the springs. Like all wetlands, they've got a saturated zone, a transition zone, and outside the zone, we were looking at the change within that zone. It's very veg species, we had botanists with us, we had remote sensing dudes, we had aquatic ecologists, all sorts of people. It was a multidisciplinary study. Lots of changes in very short distances. So uh, here's an area that is, of course, salinized because you've got a constant output of saline alkaline water from these springs. It's not terribly saline. It's only 800, 900,000 microsiemens, but give it hundreds to thousands of years, a lot of salt builds up and you get lots and lots and lots of very short distance variation in bed species related to differences in soil chemistry. So the bare patch in the middle, we've got a pH of a bit over 10 and an EC of nearly seven. So it's pretty scorchy. But there is a particular Sporobolus species that is pretty much found only in these areas around springs uh, that can, believe it or not, handle that salinity. Uh, everyone thinks that saltwater cooch is the, the most tolerant thing around. Well, nowhere near as tolerant as this other Sporobolus species. species. Uh, there's another thing, a little succulent called Trianthema. Yeah, when we get into the saltwater cooch, uh, it's only an EC of 1.7 deci siemens and the pH has come back down towards neutral. Then we get into the Rhodes grass, which you know is regarded as a pretty salt tolerant grass. It's, it's still salty in relative terms compared to what we'd normally see at the soil surface, uh, but it's nowhere near as salty as the other patches. What do we see when we do a transect across a spring? Just here, here's one particular example, that spring that I had my photograph before with the tape measure over it. Uh, we get all sorts of interesting trends that are driven by a bunch of micro topographic factors. Uh, we're talking differences in only centimeters will make you know, a difference of two, three, four de deci siemens in terms of salinity. Here we've got the outer transition zone of the spring and we've got a spike in salinity just at the very margin. So they get a salt halo around them in the zone that wets and dries because the spring uh, wetted extent fluctuates throughout the year as a result of evapotranspirative demand. In the moat, the EC is often down. So that's the area just adjacent to the spring mound. The EC often goes down because it's flushed more frequently. But in this particular spring, we had the highest EC on the western side of it, and the EC declines as you go to the east. And we pretty much put that down to sun exposure and aspect because we saw it in more than one spring. So that's, that's something at the very small scale. Uh, now we're gonna head down towards Surat uh, and look at something uh, older again, and it's more uh, a question of what we don't know than what we do know. So down between Surat and Roma and a little bit east and west of that line, um, the geology maps, there's a lot of stuff uh, delineated as tertiary sediments. We think they're related to an old paleo flow path of the Ballon way back when, uh, but that's about the sum total of what we know. Uh, for various reasons, I've dug a lot of holes in them in the last decade. And uh, there's all sorts of funny things that we can't explain. So when you zoom in on that one, for example, you can see a very red cultivated soil 
but all these grey patches, every one of those would have been a patch of Brigolo once upon a time, and you've got a sodic grey vertisol sitting in amongst a red candesol, red dermosol texture around the light clay, clay loam. Uh, we, we don't know which came first. Uh, are they all swamps that formed there? Are they particular materials that were deposited together? Uh, don't know. Those red soils, as most red soils are, exceedingly prone to wind erosion. Mark Crawford and I were driving to that spot last year and in a big windstorm we could see the red dust lifting off from 20 kilometers away. Um, when you dig them they, they look like that. I've gone down about four meters through them and they're overlaid on the under the Cretaceous mudstones underneath with a fairly abrupt boundary. The interesting thing about them is their uniformity and their texture. The, their texture is very very constant from top to bottom. It's around that light clay mark uh, there's no stones in them, which is perhaps a little bit odd for a, a tertiary fluvial deposit. Um, so we've got all these questions about them. How did we get these different materials deposited together? Um, when were they deposited in the tertiary? Uh, and is it entirely fluvial material? And for those of you who were uh, at the Canberra Soils Conference, there was a field trip up to Young uh, that I went on uh, and we had a soil pit in Parna. And I tell you, you look at that Parna and you look at this red stuff at Surat and it's identical material. Maybe this stuff is not necessarily entirely fluvial. Don't know. Uh, one day we'll dig some holes in it, try and work it out. So going from uh, the red sort of clay texture, we're going to go to looking at some red sands. Uh, and the main reason that we've been doing some of these things has been work that's been going for about 10 or 15 years, trying to find uh, suitable habitat for the northern hairy nosed wombat. It's only about 250 of them left in the world, pretty much the rarest mammal in Australia. Um, one of those threatened species that tends to fly under the radar a little bit. There's only two colonies of it on the planet, one up north of Claremont and the other out near St George. And the one out near St George was established as a result of work that we did uh, with Bruce Forster in Rockhampton years ago trying to find habitat for them. Now why I saw scientists trying to find habitat for wombats was well, pretty simple. They dig a hole in the ground and like all things that dig a hole in the ground they're a little bit fussy about what they dig in. The main historical records of the northern hairy nosed wombat are from out around St George. The Mooney floodplain, the Blonde floodplain um, were the main areas that they know that they used to exist uh, and they were living on sand ridges which are, are separated by the clay interflues. Now they call these things the bulldozers of the bush uh, for pretty good reason they can shift incredible quantities of dirt. A uh, while ago I was at Epping and walking around through the bush and there's micro relief everywhere in what is sandy soil. Uh, and the only reason for it is historical wombat diggings. Uh, so Alan there who looks after Epping, he's about six foot two. He's leaning over a little bit sitting down there but it gives you an idea of how deep that hole is in the ground. And there's his head just poking out, out the top of, a, of another burrow entrance. Uh, they can shift very, very substantial amounts of dirt. So that leads us to go digging very deep holes, um, looking for uh, a minimum of three metres of soil because work that they have done at Epping um, suggests that the burrows go down as deep as four metres in the ground. Uh, so we're pretty fussy in terms of what they want. It has to be not too heavy, not too light, just right sort of texture, somewhere around sandy loam, sandy clay loam. Uh, pure sand's no good, falls in. Heavier clays are no good. Uh, and it's got to be three or four metres deep. When you go digging deep, it leads to all sorts of difficult questions because most of our soil's descriptive 
context and things like soil classification are all designed around the concept that we only dig a hole about one and a half to two meters deep. You can use the yellow book to describe down as far as you like, uh, but you do run into some interesting questions. These are the sorts of landscapes that, you know, that we're looking at. Uh, Cypress Pine, Sand Ridge Country, Moreton Bay Ash, things like that. Dig a hole, you get nice deep red sandy loam. Top of the pops for wombats. Then you go and dig a hole and you hit something like this. And uh, when you're trying to allocate horizons and soil classification, it all starts to get really, really difficult. I won't bore you to death with it now, but it does start to make you think about what you describe and what you classify is really much just a function of how deep you dig a hole. Um, because if you've got a bleach on top of a pan at three meters, well, it's still a bleach. You're going to be calling it a bleach day too, but what do you call everything above it? Similarly, that hole there, uh, you get all sorts of interesting things uh, that make us start to uh, think about how well designed some of our terminology is. So back into some clay, uh, we're going to head uh, whiz down past Thallon because Thallon is where that big wombat is. You can go there and climb on top of him and have your photo taken. Look at the picturesque silos there as well. We're going to go to the east, southeast from Thallon down into the Weir River catchment. Now, the Weir River abuts the New South Wales border. We've got the Mooney River to the north of it. For those of you who are into geomorphology, you'll notice a really obvious feature in the pathway of the Mooney River. It's not often you see rivers do 90 degree dog legs and usually when they do it means they're structurally controlled or there's been stream capture. In this case it's stream capture um, and we're 99% confident that the top of the Mooney River has been captured by the Weir River uh, and what is now the top of the Weir River used to run across there to the, the west end of the Mooney. There used to be a catchment boundary running somewhere through there. There may have even been further capture to the south uh, and all of that has led to that dog leg and, and weird direction in the river. We're going down the bottom end of it uh, where there's some fairly old relic diluvia that's draped up onto hill slopes of uh, very intensely weathered Grime and Creek formation. And we were digging holes down there for bit like the, the stuff at Condamine, investigations of salinity risk from irrigation. So once again, what do you see when you dig a hole a bit deeper than normal? Uh, well, to begin with, if we look at clay content, as you'd expect in relic diluvia, there are a series of very obvious finding up sequences. You see the increase in clay content up to about nine meters, and then it drops back, and then it increases again, and then it drops back stayed very sandy for a while, and then it's increased from four meters up to the modern surface. Very, very common pattern when you do particle size on all of the alluvia. Dig a hole in any floodplain in Western Queensland, odds on you'll hit sand within six meters. Uh, the, what we see as vertisoles across all of our floodplains are on average only about six meters thick. Now, if you look at chloride, and if I had EC as well, you'd see that they chop around a bit. Um, EC in particular uh, follows the clay content pretty well. Uh, but pH, once that pH inversion occurred at two meters, it stayed at a pH of 4.3 from top to bottom, irrespective of what the clay content was doing. Sand or clay didn't matter, pH 4.3. Uh, once again, chemists can work that one out. Um, chloride, it's normal levels we would see around the 1500 mark in Western vertisols, but at six meters, it doubles. And it stayed pretty high other than one little blip uh, related to the top uh, of uh, the bottom of that sequence there when it got into some sand. When we look at a bunch of profiles down there, they all did the same thing their chloride content started to go up substantially and often doubled at around the seven metre mark, six and a half, seven metres. We think that that's a, probably a paleoclimate signature, uh, that it's a feature from historical leaching of salts down 
to that depth. Um, some of these holes, we did hit groundwater in them. Uh, groundwater is normally around 40, 50,000 microsiemens. But once again, when you dig a deep hole, you see some things that, that you don't expect. Another way of looking at that change in chloride down the profiles is if you plot the chloride above the orange line versus, uh, and the chloride below the orange line separately uh, against silt and clay, and you get that roughly the same alignment in terms of relationship to silt and clay, but very, very clearly separated. So there's lots going on down deep, and it also reiterates why in our old landscapes, it's not just the salt that you see in the top meter, meter and a half you've got to worry about from salinity risk, it's the salt down deep that you've got to worry about. And when you do the sums on it, there is an enormous amount of salt in these landscapes. So to finish off, we're going to go back to a spring, not quite where we started, um, but um, a bigger scale to what we were looking at before. Uh, the springs we're looking up near Injun and Tarum, the biggest one was about the size of a tennis court. Here we're going to the Yalabin Desert. So between um, Gundawindi and Englewood, you've got the little tiny town of Yalabin on the confluence of the McIntyre Brook and the Dumeric River. And Yalabin Desert is called Yalabin Desert because there's basically no surface water there. It's a pretty barren kind of place. Um, and it's about 40 square kilometers roughly in size, which makes it, as far as we can tell, the biggest defunct GAB spring in Queensland and potentially one of the biggest in Australia. Um, earlier on when we are at Condamine, I mentioned the Cumbrilla Ridge. We're now at the bottom end of the Cumbrilla Ridge. So it runs north, south, all the way down to New South Wales, becomes the Pilliga Sandstone in New South Wales. And that means we're at the eastern edge of the Great Artesian Basin here. Uh, so as you go east of that red circle, the Jurassic sandstones drop out very quickly and you get into the trap rock, um, the New England Fold Belt. West of here, uh, particularly west of the Gundawindi Fault, is all Cretaceous mudstones that cap the GAB. So we're right on the eastern side of the GAB and all that forested country is regarded as recharge zone uh, for the GAB because it's relatively quartzo sandstones. Uh, now, why is the Yalabin Desert where it is? Why is this big spring feature there? Some people have suggested there's an old fault line that comes up from New South Wales. Other people have suggested it's merely due to hydraulic head in the Jumeric River. Uh, we don't have any definitive proof either way, but I think the second of those reasons is the most likely. So when we zoom in there, there's your Laban. Um, as I said, we've got the, the McIntyre Brook coming down here. The McIntyre Brook has cut through in relatively recent time the Cumbrilla sandstones, a little nick point there at Booba Sands. You've got the Jumeric River coming from the southeast. Down to the bottom left of the image, you've actually got the McIntyre River as well. Uh, and they all head off down towards Gundawindi. Um, when you look at Yalabin, there's the town at the top. Uh, pretty barren, bare area. Uh, and it's like that for a reason, uh, which is all related to upwelling of GAB water. Interestingly, someone wants to put a dirty great big train line through here uh, shortly. Um, so what do you see at Yalabin? Well, that's what the good country at Yalabin looks like. It actually has a bit of grass. Um, and not just grass, but like the other spring areas, there are some very, very unique uh, vegetation species. Um, there's this thing called Melaleuca densis piccata, which pretty much only grows in GAB springs. And the biggest extent of it is down here at Yalabin. It's also the easternmost uh, spinifex in Queensland as far as I've been able to work out. So there's, you know, texture contrast soil, silty clay loams, textures like that, bit of clay in the subsoil. That's the better soil at Yalabin. Big chunk of Yalabin actually looks like that because uh, the historical GAB upwelling has essentially saturated the soil with sodium. If you do an ESP of that soil, it comes out as pretty much 100% sodium. There's virtually nothing else on the exchange. pH is around 10, maybe sneak up to 10 and a half. 
uh, I think 11 might be the highest we've ever recorded. So an exceedingly unstable landscape. Got flogged by rabbits in the great drought way back when, and it's been eroding and falling apart ever since, and there's no way to ever stop that happening. Gets lots of weird and wonderful things down there. Uh, this is what we call coralliferous carbonate. People have seen it elsewhere around Australia. For some reason, it doesn't occur in the yellow book. But when you pick that calcium carbonate up, you would swear you were looking at a piece of coral. Uh, as far as we know, it's actually formed in old root channels. Uh, and that's why it, it has the shapes it does. It's essentially followed old root channels. Sometimes you can find hollows in the middle of them. I found a recent example up near Springshore about the thickness of my finger, and it still actually had the dead roots inside it. You get other things down there like black alkali. So that black coating on the soil there, you see every time it rains, and that's dissolved organic matter. Uh, the high pH causes the organic matter to go into solution and it just washes out of the soil. Because the Yalapan Desert was once upon a time a lot more active, uh, if you look very, very carefully in the soil, you find lots of um, preserved um, hollow stem reeds. So there's, there's a surprising amount of organic matter floating around in what looks like a very low organic matter soil. Way back when, uh, I don't know exactly when, but I think it was about the 1960s or 70s, someone went out there and did some ripping trials. Um, we found them by pure chance walking through there and you can see them on old aerial photos. And that's what they look like today. And you can see the rip line has actually solidified and hardened compared to the soil either side. Uh, once again, another one of those great mysteries out there. So that pretty much concludes our little Western tour and brings us back home to Toowoomba. I hope you've all enjoyed the esoteric and fun facts, mysteries of the West. Uh, if you've got any questions, you can raise your hand to Aditi and I think she'll channel them to me. Okay, a huge thank you, Big Z, for that amazing talk. Um, I love, I do apologize, that photo hole incident is my fault. I was a bit desperate when I used that one, <laughs> but I think it's gotten enough material. For the people who joined late, the recording will be available soon. And I'm sure Big Z, if he wants, he'll soon show everyone that photo again because of everyone who might have <laughs> missed that in the presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to either put them in the chat at the bottom or raise your hand and I can pass them to... Big Z, we've got some great feedback coming, Big Z saying excellent presentation and a gorgeous final photo. Um, so good choose, good presentation skills there, Big Z, choosing a great photo to end on. No uh, uh, anybody got any questions for Big Z? Okay. Um, well, I just, I, I, I'm really surprised in the number of times in this presentation, Big Z, that you dug a hole. <laughs> oh, that's my job. <laughs> oh, it's something that I think comes with us being soil scientists. Yes. It's that sort of world. Um, I'm just going to, if nobody has any questions yet, I might just pause on the screen sharing for a second, if that's okay. Yep. Oh, sorry. No, we've got questions coming through. Um, Mark Crawford is asking, how much gypsum would you apply to Eularbin? Uh, well, it was Mark Crawford covered in mud there early on, which is why he's asking smart-ass questions. <laughs> of course. I'll lean around the wall here and talk to him afterwards. <laughs> so you don't want to answer the question for everybody? You couldn't add enough gypsum. Um, so Don is asking, what might, be, what might the ripping trials at Yellarborn have been for? I'm guessing that they were just trying to deal with the fact that they had a bare, barren paddock that wouldn't grow anything. And uh, like many people have done with scalded plains out west, they've ripped it to try and get some germination. And if you loosen it up, you'll invariably get seeds will blow in and lodge in the rip lines and you'll get some amount of germination in it. Um, uh, David Freeburn has suggested the answer, linear rabbits. <laughs> 
Um, Luke Mosley has asked, drivers of very low pH in some subsoils. Can you elaborate on reasons for that? No, that's why I keep asking the chemists to work it out for me. <laughs> Sorry, Luke, we don't have an answer yet. <laughs> we, have have some, we have some ideas, Luke, and people have postulated you know, uh, historically. Ray Isbell, way back when, believed that the soils were forming in an acid state in situ and that the alkaline surface on them was to do with atmospheric inputs of alkali during the last glacial periods. Uh, other people have suggested that their groundwater features, relic groundwater features like inland acid sulfate soil related acidity in southern Australia. Um, um, my current view is that we, th we think they're forming in situ. I've seen enough holes that were dug on hill slopes into weathering bedrock and the weathering bedrock has a pH of four, four and a half. You know, acid mine leachate in marine Permian sediments is well known in central Queensland. Our sediments here are not Permian, they're Cretaceous, but they are marine and we know they do have pyrite in them. Uh, so it's the most logical explanation is that it's essentially a geological source of acidity. Um, Philippa, Queensland misses you too. Um, Ra Dr. Rama asks that the pH contrast in Brigalow High, pH top and low pH below, question mark. Yes, yeah, alkaline in the top and acid below. And the pH inversion typically always matches an EC bulge, uh, increase in sodicity. Uh, there's obviously some relationship to the wetting front. Uh, and the other thing that you notice is that often you'll have free carbonate above in the alkaline zone and you'll have gypsum below. And uh, as acid sulfates or chemists would be familiar, you throw some lime on some acid and you can easily get gypsum as a byproduct. Um, and I think what I might aim for as a final question, unless we get something when I've got, um, when I'm not running OGM, we've got A Young asking, have you tried mapping springs in non-saline areas using EM? Uh, no. And I haven't, I haven't seen many non-saline springs in our part of the world. They always end up with a salt halo around them. Sorry, A Young. Um, I guess that's it for well, that's all I'm getting for questions at the moment. 